We know that taxes generally create what's known as deadweight loss or loss of economic efficiency when they're placed on otherwise well-functioning markets. So it's tempting to think because a subsidy has the opposite market impact of a tax that maybe a subsidy is this magical creature that actually creates value rather than destroys value. So it's worth going through this exercise and understanding how a subsidy affects the amount of value that is created by a market. And to do that, we can think in terms of our typical welfare table and we could look at what consumer surplus, producer surplus, government revenue, and total surplus look like, both in the free market and under the subsidy, so we can analyze the changes in the value created the result. To do this, I've drawn our market diagram and I put a subsidy in place. I labeled the original free market price and quantity and also the prices to the producer and to the consumer and the equilibrium quantity once the subsidy is put in place. And I also went through and labeled the relevant areas that we'd be working with with these letters so we could refer to them when drawing our welfare table and looking at consumer surplus, producer surplus, and so on and so forth. So analyzing this is pretty straightforward, and it just relies on the three rules that we know about consumer surplus and producer surplus. So we can think about consumer surplus in our free market. Let me fill in this box here. Say consumer surplus is just the, pre the area above the price that the consumer pays, below the demand curve, and to the left of the quantity that's being transacted. So we could look here and we could say, all right, above the price that's relevant in a free market, which is just this price here, below the demand curve, to the left of the quantity being transacted in the free market, that's going to give consumers A and B. Here's A plus B goes over here. I'm going to do the same for producer surplus. We have three rules for producer surplus. So producer surplus is the area above the supply curve below the relevant price for producers, which again is still P star in our free market, and to the left of the quantity being transacted. So in our free market, we can see that producers get areas C and D. So you put C plus D here. By definition, in a free market, government revenue is zero, because there's no government involvement, and total surplus, or social surplus, depending on what notation your textbook uses, it's just going to be the sum of all these things, or A plus B plus C plus D. Now, to analyze surplus under the subsidy, we just do the same thing. We just have to make sure that we're applying our rules very literally, because otherwise things get a little bit weird. So again, when we have the subsidy in place, we can say that consumer surplus is the area above the relevant price for the consumer, which is now here, so above here, below the demand curve, and to the left of the quantity that's being transacted, which is now this higher quantity here. So we can say once the subsidy is put in place, the consumers are getting not just A and B, but A, B, C, F, and G. Similarly, we can apply our rules for producer surplus. And we can say that producer surplus is everything below the price that the producer gets, which is now up here, above the supply curve, to the left of the quantity that's being transacted, which is now out here. So we see producers getting B plus E plus C plus D. Right, that, that gives us this triangle here. Government revenue now is a little bit of a strange animal. So remember when we talked about a tax, the government revenue collected from that tax was just the amount per unit of the tax times how many units were being bought and sold. So now, if we think about not the revenue from the subsidy, but the cost of the subsidy, we could say that the cost of the subsidy in total rather than per unit, is just the per unit cost of the subsidy, which we labeled as S, 
times the number of units that are being bought and sold once the subsidy is put in place, which is just this Q sub S star, right? So we can say we have a reasonable measure for the cost of the subsidy, but how does that impact our calculation for government revenue? As it turns out, revenue and cost are just the negatives of one another. So the cost of the subsidy is just the amount of negative government revenue that this subsidy results in. So if the government's paying out money, it's getting negative revenue. Really not more complicated than that. So we want to find an area on our diagram that's equal to this amount here. And usually the easiest thing to do is to find a rectangle that has these dimensions. Because we know that a rectangle has area of length times width, just the multiplication of the two dimensions of the rectangle. So if we could find that, we would know that the area would be this quantity here. And luckily we can find that. We can look here and we can notice, oh look, we have the per unit amount of our subsidy being this vertical distance here. And we have the quantity transacted with the subsidy being this horizontal distance here. So we can see that the cost of the subsidy to the government is this whole rectangle here. And represented in our lettering scheme, this is going to be negative, because costs are negative revenues, B plus E plus C plus F plus G plus H. Really not more complicated than that. The reasoning is pretty much the same as we had with a tax. We just have to remember that because a subsidy is a negative tax, that we also end up with a negative in terms of government revenue. So we can go through now and we can calculate the changes for each individual party to understand who is made better off and who is made worse off when a subsidy is put in place. So we notice here the consumers used to only get A and B, now they get A, B, C, F, and G. So their change is just this minus this, or C, F, and G. So consumers gain from a subsidy. Not surprisingly, because they're consuming more than they were before, and they're consuming more at a lower price. That's good for consumers. Similarly, producers used to get C and D in a free market. Now they're getting B, E, C, and D. So they were graced with an additional B plus E because of this subsidy. And we can put that here. And it's also not particularly surprising that producers are made better off by the subsidy because they're able to get a higher price for what they're selling, and they're selling more of it. That sounds good for producers. The government, unfortunately, is made worse off because it used to be spending zero, now it's spending all this stuff. So its change is just this minus zero, so it's just this whole thing over again. So the negative B plus E plus C plus F plus G plus H. And if we were to add all of these up, we could figure out whether society overall is made better off or worse off. So we want to be careful when we're doing this. And the easiest thing to do is actually to go through one letter at a time. So you can put everything in order. And you'll notice, so let's start with A. You have an A here, and A doesn't show up anywhere else. So we just know that in our total we have an A. If we look at B's, we have a B here and a B here. So we have two plus 2B and then minus 1B. So we're left with 1B. If we look at our C's, we have plus 2C, one each from consumers and producers, but then minus 1 here. So we're left with plus 1C. We can look for D's. The D's only show up here. So we have plus 1D. Our E, there's one E here, but then it's subtracted out here. So that leaves us with zero E's. Don't need to write that down. 
our f's, we have an f that shows up here, but then it's subtracted out here, leaving us with zero f's. Don't need to write that down. We have a g that shows up here, but then it's subtracted out, leaving us with zero g's. Don't need to write that down. And lastly, we have an h, but that h only shows up here. And remember, this is the part that was negative. So we actually have to subtract out that h. And what this means is that our change in total surplus is this minus this. So our change in total surplus is actually negative. And we know that deadweight loss is defined as the reduction in social surplus or total surplus when some sort of regulation is put in place. So by definition, this reduction is in the amount h. And we could say that we then, as a result of our subsidy, get deadweight loss of this amount h. So let's think through a few things here. Again, the main takeaway from this is that subsidies do not create economic value. They, in fact, lower economic value in a similar way to taxes lowering economic value, which is not surprising because we know that well-functioning competitive markets maximize the value that can be created for society. So it stands to reason that any distortion in one direction or the other, whether it be something that's meant to discourage activities such as a tax or something that's meant to encourage activities such as a subsidy, that those would both lower or decrease the overall size of the economic pie, which is what we're seeing here. The other thing that you may have noticed that's a little bit strange is that all of a sudden when we have the subsidy in place, we have areas that are going both to consumers and to producers. So you notice the area B was both here and here, the area C was both here and here, and so on and so forth. And you say, well, huh, what's going on with that? That I can see my areas over here, so why are they all now showing up in both of these? And the reason is that counting them once is real, right? Because we have in this region for the units that were already being consumed without the subsidies help, we still have the fact that the consumer values the item more than it costs to produce. So there is one iteration of B and C happening naturally because markets are creating that sort of value. But we're getting this doubling of these areas B and C because the government's kicking in the other one. Okay, and that's why we're subtracting it out here when we're talking about the cost of the subsidy. So that's not actually as weird as it seems. Intuitively, you can think about subsidies being inefficient in the sense that, for example, it would cost the government more than $100 to provide benefits to consumers and producers equal to $100, because there's something that gets lost in that process. Okay, So of course, the next question to think about is, well, does that mean that subsidies should never be given? Not necessarily. We want to think about when they might be appropriate. And one of the assumptions that we made here is that we had a well-functioning competitive market. If we took away that assumption, as we see, as we see when we talk about externalities, it may be the case that a subsidy can actually increase rather than decrease the value created for society. It might also be the case that even when we have an otherwise well-functioning market, that we view the trade-off between economic efficiency and fairness such that it might be worth sacrificing a little bit of economic inefficiency in order to make a particular good or service available and affordable for more people.